Well, um, there's a few ideas out there of um, Arab entrepreneurs uh, from the Gulf who are, would like to see some um, collective effort to either tap into the sovereign wealth funds of the GCC countries or possibly money, you know, of funds that are available to one or more of the GCC countries in a fund that could be almost a, I mean, there's lots of possible directions this could go in, but could we have a joint U.S.-Arab uh, OPIC equivalent or something that would be seed money for new enterprises that would be allow small and medium enterprises to expand. Um, there, so I, I think there's some ideas out there that could be channeled in, in very creative ways. There are obviously many, many barriers and obstacles. I think that some of the um, Arab uh, innovators, entrepreneurs who want to uh, be agents of change in the Arab world are themselves uncomfortable dealing with the new governments in North Africa in particular, that they don't know who to trust, the, the regulatory environment isn't clear enough yet, etc. So whereas we would be very much obliged to be working in kind of institutionally legal ways, uh, whether some of the investments that are done by Arab investors tend to be directly to the private sector and not necessarily through public policy. But I do think there's a yearning um, to, uh, to do useful and, and constructive and very strategic things um, that we have these conversations with influential people in the Gulf and I would love to see, you know, some of this, you know, through, there's the Forum for the Future, there's, there's many existing platforms and organizations and institutions that could, um, you know, also be mobilized or could be used. But I do think there's no substitute for American leadership and organizational skill and what just seems to me to be desirable here is to play to all of the players' strengths in some coordinated combined effort uh, to make some of the infrastructure investments, the building institutions, um, and strengthening the countries in transition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next here. Hi, David Galbraith from the Department of State and currently a fellow at Georgetown University. And this question is primarily for Ms. Lapson and Mr. Broomberg. <clears throat> And I'm wondering if you could address a little bit more um, broadly the tension between the importance of the democratization process in the countries in transition, uh, including constitutional reform, for the United States, but also the kind of delicacy and difficulty of our engagement uh, at the moment. Uh, I think both of you touched on different aspects of this in your remarks, and specifically <clears throat> on the question of constitutional uh, uh, change and reform, what sort of tools should the U.S. government be using now to try to shape that process or influence that process, if any? Thank you. Well, uh, let me just, it's a very fine question and the answer is not obvious at all. I would say that I re-emphasize the point I made before. Uh, you, you arrive at a moment in a transition where you establish certain kinds of precepts certain kinds of uh, principles and you institutionalize them and that has a long-term effect. So what's going on now make, will make a lot of difference in the long run if it's done right and could be very harmful if it's done wrong. Having said that, I think we're doing what we need to do. I mean, we do not have, need to go too publicly and be talking about the nature of these compromises. We have to quietly encourage, and we have all kinds of experts in the field. Some of them are sitting right here in this room right now, uh, who have been working with our colleagues in Egypt and, and uh, in, uh, in Tunisia and in Libya. We are doing the same at USIP, particularly in uh, Tunisia, to help them on a quiet level address these issues and provide ideas. So I think we have to be able to continue to engage, but at the same time, we're not there to use strong-arm tactics or go public in a way which will make life difficult for moderate Islamists who, as I said before, are trying to, uh, uh, trying to be inclusive at the same time are pressed by radicals to uh, pr pursue a Sharia-based uh, uh, project. I am very impressed by how Morsi and Ranushi so far have maintained this balance, I have to say, for the most part. Um, and I think that uh, quiet diplomacy and assistance are the best ways to go. I think some of um, America's soft power in setting both as a model and introducing some of the skills, whether it's information technology or nonviolent resistance or you know, some of the institution building ideas of, of democratic change, really 
were done before the Arab Spring began. I mean, I think it's a long history, and it's a that we we did influence and shape the values and the ideas of the people who who themselves took the power um, to to implement the Arab Spring. So I think that it's paradoxically this is a moment where maybe we should do less um, because some of this this talent and these uh, skills and, and goals are already now locally owned. They're indigenous uh, to the Arab world. The other thing I really think we need to do is remind ourselves that we are not the perfect model in terms of democratic behavior. We have to demonstrate more capacity to improve our own democratic culture at home, uh, which I think would also be a powerful message to the people who are going through these transitions. Let me emphasize one word that Ellen said, long. Yes. It's not going to be solved overnight. We've got to be patient. The other thing, I have to laugh. I traveled around the world last year trying to explain how you could win the popular vote and still not be elected president of the United States. I mean, people have a very, very difficult time you know, in the world understanding that. Yeah. Not to mention, what, what did it take us 13 years to get our constitution, our zone, straightened out? And then we had a civil war. Anyway, go ahead. Small fact of history. Um, Sadiq Amini, a Fulbright Scholar from Afghanistan, graduate student at Patterson School of Diplomacy. Uh, it's an open question to the panel. What about Israeli-Palestinian issue? What different approach the US administration should uh, adopt? Dan. Oh, all right. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Uh, look, I, I think that basically, you know, Israel's going to have an election in January. We've just had one. And after that, uh, I think what, we all need to sit down and, and, focus, uh, and focus on it. And, uh, you know, by and large, we all know how it's going to end. I mean, the 67 borders adjusted for, uh, uh, you know, land swaps and all of that type of thing. And I think the United States should, uh, you know, t uh, get, get involved and take a leadership role. Um, will it work? You know, I, I don't know. But even if you try and you, you know, do it, then I think you get, you know, your perception in the, uh, in the Arab and Muslim world goes up. Because a lot of times when you're ignoring it, people think you're de facto supporting Israel, when in fact you may not, uh, not be doing that. Well, I would just say that, you know, somebody asked earlier, you know, are, are we Israel-centric? My own personal view is that if we were really Israel-centric, we would be doing everything we could at the right time. This may not be the right time, but eventually to encourage the Palestinians and Israelis to move towards a two-state solution. That would be a, a solution that would be in Israel's interest, as well as the Palestinians. Um, when we should do this, how we should re-engage is a matter of some discussion. Who should be leading this effort? But eventually, yeah, my colleague to my left here, who perhaps should be to my right, uh, but in any case, it's a small joke. Um, we're good buddies in any case. Uh, you know, we, you, we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, it, that is true. It's very hard for a president to focus or an administration on any one major issue. But eventually, this thing is going to come back, and it's going to affect the structure uh, of, of, of regional stability. And I, my concern, apart from the future of Palestinian-Israeli peacemaking, is how that's going to affect the whole democracy equation. Thank you. Question here. Hi, Stephanie Osborne from Occidental Petroleum. Um, my question is for Mr. Korb, although I'd be interested in everyone else's perspectives. It's about your comment that if Iran gets the bomb, it's not the end of the world, which I think is a valid perspective. But what do you think that would mean for Iraq and for the United States' continued efforts in Iraq and in the region? Thanks. Yeah, I, I try to, you know, I remember when I, I went to Iraq the second time, and I, with the National Academy of Public Administration sent us to help, you know, Iraq build its government institutions. And so this was, you know, I, I, they told me when I get to, uh, to Iraq that there'll be some security people there, but uh, basically they won't have your name on it, you know, because they're worried about. It. Anyway, make a long story short, they did have my name on it, and I, I was driven in from the airport by this private security firm. And the guy in there was telling me something. He said, oh, it's amazing. He was uh, uh, from South Africa. And he said, when your officials come here, they come in in the middle of the night. They don't tell anybody, and they fly in. Ahmad Dinejad comes in, gives six days' notice, comes in and drives in, you know. And, and I think we should have recognized that before we went into Iraq, that, in fact, we would empower Iran. 
And, you know, they, you know, I mean, Iraq, I, I remember even back during the, when um, the uh, Hezbollah was waging war on Israel, Maliki, this is in 2006, was supporting uh, Hezbollah. So, I mean, what did you, you know, what did you expect? And I, I, and I do think that Iran and Iraq are going to have, a, you know, a relationship, a strong relationship. And I think that the key thing is, you know, if it wasn't for Iran, Maliki wouldn't still be in power because they persuaded Muqtada al-Sadr to support him. Remember, he didn't win the election, okay? So I think, you know, them getting the nuclear weapon, you know, this will be seen as, uh, you know, if you will, the Shia bomb. If, you know, they, they in fact get it. Now, do they want to? I don't think anybody wants Iran to get it given, you know, the unpredictable consequences. But if they were to get it, I don't think, you know, uh, Iraq would break off relations with them or anything like that. Could I add just a quick remark on this? We have, we have this discussion of Iran getting the bomb as if it's going to get the bomb. And then, you know, and when Al and I were running this group, I remember an interesting moment where one of our colleagues, I can't mention his name, said, you know, you can't do much with a bomb. You need a family of bombs, yes, yeah. which is a kind of strange love uh, moment because a family of bombs seems kind of a strange metaphor. But Good I right. remember that moment. But it was instructive because if you just have, you, you open up, I have a bomb. Well, that's, that's a, not a wise policy. The Iranians uh, want to maintain a, a, a high degree of ambiguity about this. One crucial issue, and we can debate it, is how much ambiguity we can live with under what conditions. But the notion that the Iranians are just going to get the bomb and they're going to announce it and then invite an Israeli retaliation, which would come rather quickly, I think is, is, is naive. Okay. Thank you. I think we need to wrap this up now, actually. But let me ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for, I think, very stimulating conversation. Thank you. I, too, want to thank uh, our wonderful moderator and our panelists. I want to let you all know that we're tweeting, so follow us at Middle East Inst. Our hashtag is MEI Conference. We now have a 15-minute coffee break. We'll begin again at 1045. Please check out our publications table and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you. No question about Syria.